channel where every week I whisper about a different horror movie that I love. As you can see by my hat, maybe this guy back here, and just knowing what month it is because you're intelligent, you know what time of year it is. We are in full on holiday mode here over at Slay SMR, which means that for the entire month of December, I will be covering a different Christmas themed horror movie every week that I love. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, there's really only one way to start off a month of Christmas themed horror movies, and I have watched the movie you're thinking of <laughs> that we will definitely get to, and I was going to do that movie first. I'm not going to say it, but I think you know what it is. It's, to me, the granddaddy of Christmas horror movies. Maybe not the granddaddy, because it's not the oldest Christmas horror movie that I know of, but it's definitely the most iconic, at least in my opinion, so maybe it's the grand nephew <laughs> of Christmas themed horror movies. I was going to start with that movie, but then I got a text from my friend Matt Elliott uh, last night. I'm recording this on uh, Sunday, so I got a text from him on Saturday night saying, Happy Krampusnacht. I think I'm saying that right. I think it's German for uh, Krampus Night or Krampus Eve. And essentially what that is, is on December 5th, which is the night before the Feast of St. Nicholas, which in Europe is a very traditional um, holiday tradition having to do with St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, Chris, Chris Kringle, you get the idea. The night before that is Krampus Knot or Krampus Night when Krampus, who is the Yule Lord, the anti-Santa Claus, if you will, um, he gets to celebrate his night and parade the streets and I believe in Europe and Bavarian nations and elsewhere. People dress up, there will be a parade. It's, it's the naughty version of the Christmas parade, if you will. So, with it being December 5th, December 7th, by the time that you're watching it, and it being so close to Krampus Knot, I figured I have to start this off with Krampus. It would be unwise of me. Krampus himself might come after me if I, I don't do that <laughs> this week, if I don't start off with his movie. Now, Krampus, of course, has many movies, uh, I feel like in recent years especially, we've seen Krampus featured in a lot of Christmas horror films. There's a Christmas horror story. Uh, I think there's one called Krampus the Reckoning, Krampus Origins. He's a very popular figure when it comes to Christmas horror movies, and if I'm being honest, I think those films uh, tend to be a little bit campier. They tend to be of the B- Variety. Nothing wrong with that, of course. Lots of people like campy B or movies. Um, it's not quite my style. And also, let's be real. If you're going to watch an ASMR video on a Krampus movie, you want it to be 2015. So Krampus, of course, um, directed by Trick or Treat. It's Michael Doherty, written by Doherty, co-written by Doherty, along with. Let me see what the uh, the names of these other screenwriters are here, Todd Casey and Zach Shields. So that's what we're starting with today, 2015's Krampus. Before we get into it, a little bit of context is in order. I've already mentioned that Krampus is, in a way, the dark side of Santa Claus, which we very much see explored in this movie. No one really knows the origins of Krampus, but they know that they, they, they attribute it possibly to pagan traditions or something that predates Christianity in Europe. Um, either way, the concept is very simple. Where Santa Claus comes to deliver joy and presents to the 
you know, good girls and boys. Krampus is the one who punishes the naughty ones, and he has a bundle of birch sticks <laughs> um, that he apparently hits them with, and he'll carry them off in his sack. He's usually depicted as a goat-like creature. Um, he's got horns, a long tongue, cloven hooves, all that good stuff. And they deviate a little bit from that in this movie, which we'll, we'll get around to. So that's Krampus, and yeah, so the Krampus in this film, when I, when I heard about it coming out, I actually got it confused, or not confused, but I thought it was going to be an adaptation of this book. Sorry, I don't know how to dab yet. <laughs> but this is Krampus the Yule Lord by Brahm, who is a fantasy illustrator who I love. And as you can see here, the, the Krampus in this book looks very much like Krampus as we come to know him, the more satyr, goat-like creature. Um, and there's some similarities to the movie. I'll see if I can find any in here. Um, he has dark elves, just like he does in this film. Um, although this novel, uh, Krampus the Yule Lord, it goes a lot more into the, um, the actual lore of Krampus and mixes it up with Norse mythology. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but you should really check it out. It's a much more mythologically detailed take on the story as opposed to the film. And they're completely different animals. I love them both for different reasons. And Brahms' art is just fantastic. I'm trying to find a, uh, let's see. Of course, when I want to show you all these cool illustrations, I can't, I can't find any in the book, right? Um, okay, here's one. Give me one second. Uh, that's a black and white one. I'm really trying to find, yeah, oh, here we go, okay. So, yeah, there's, that's Krampus, okay. And then, let me see. Yeah, these are, uh, some of his, his dark elves. So yeah, and um, there's a really cool twist on Santa Claus in this book that I won't spoil here. Anyway, backing up to 2015, I thought that that's what the film was going to be. And it's not, of course. Um, in this Brahms Krampus, it's much more about Krampus being kind of an anti-hero. And he is an assistant, not an assistant, but he is in cahoots with the protagonist. Whereas in the 2015 film, he's much more of the antagonist. We actually don't see him a ton. He's kind of operating everything, controlling the strings from the corners of the chimney, if you will. So in 2015, I thought it was going to be this. But of course, what 2015's Krampus is about is a dysfunctional family. Um, Adam Scott, Tony Collette are the parents. And the son is really disillusioned with how Christmas has had its downfall in their household. They still celebrate it, but the family, the dad's a workaholic, the mom is really stressed out, the sister's kind of apathetic to everything, and then they have this extended family coming over, um, headed by David Koechner, who's playing another jerk <laughs> in this, as David Koechner tends to do. And they are, they're a little bit lower class, they're equally as miserable, but in different ways, and Christmas has just become this torturous experience where this little boy feels much more pain, um, as opposed to the joy that used to come with it. And the film opens with this montage of Christmas being overly consumer and people fighting each, over, each other over gifts in the store, the typical kind of holiday malaise that we see and everything from, uh, your good man, Charlie Brown, sorry, uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas, to jingle all the way. And as a result, the kid kind of pulls a home alone. He rips up his letter to Santa, throws it into the wind, and this ends up summoning Krampus, who wrecks havoc upon the entire family because, like Kevin McAllister, the kid has wished his family away and wished Christmas away. Now, the 
Krampus in this tale does have Bavarian origins. Um, the grandmother in the film, she is German, and she had a very personal experience with Krampus as a kid. But beyond that, Michael Doherty and co, they, they take a lot of liberties with the appearance of Krampus. I don't know if I can really say take liberties. Krampus is probably a fictional <laughs> being, right? Uh, it's not like they're offending the real-life Krampus, although maybe he is real. I don't know. That would be cool. But the Krampus in this is really playing into this idea of the dark Santa. He's got really long St. Nicholas-esque robes. He's got a really long beard. He does have the big cloven hooves. He does have horns coming out of his head, but he's more of this hulking beast as opposed to the Krampus in this book and elsewhere who appears to be a more spry, agile sort of monster. But as I was watching it this time around, I actually wondered, they, they only really show a close-up of Krampus's face at the end. And like I said, it's the really ratty Santa beard and this perpetually open mouth with a really long tongue. And I was actually wondering this time, I was wondering if the idea is that it's supposed to be a mask, like a really demented Santa mask, and underneath is the goat creature that we've all come to know, because like I said, we do see the horns, we do see the hooves, and Krampus' mouth never moves, his facial expressions never move. We see his eyes darting around a little bit, but it looks like they could be sunken in, like under latex. So I thought that was really interesting this time around, if it, it is the Krampus that we all know underneath. He's just dressing up as Santa, which is pretty freaky in itself. It's this mockery, this perversion of Santa. I really do love the creature effects in this movie. Uh, they're from the Way to Workshop, you know, which handled Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia. It's, uh, it's kind of Peter Jackson's in-house special effects depot. So yeah, the imagery in this film is really playing into this idea of an evil Saint Nick. Um, he has this legion of demonic toys with him. There's a feral looking teddy bear that has fangs and slobber and is you know, vicious. There are these li little gingerbread men that, you know, in the tradition of small soldiers and gremlins and anything like that, they all band together and go after David Keckner with a nail gun and have a lot of gleeful fun while doing it. There's a really gnarly looking robot that almost reminds me of Trapjaw from Masters of the Universe uh, who attacks Adam Scott. There's a cherub, which is an angel at the top of the Christmas tree, a Christmas tree dopper, but she's almost like a harpy. She has talons and fangs and flaps after people. They're the dark elves, which I mentioned, which are pretty much elves. They just have these really twisted masks on them. Instead of reindeer, Krampus has yule goats. We only see them a little bit at the end, but I think they're pretty effective. They're these gigantic goats with skull faces who headbutt each other. I'd really like to see some more shots of them. And in my opinion, the scariest monster of all in the movie is this jack-in-the-box that becomes a jack out of the box. <laughs> it springs elongate into this almost worm-like shape, and the jack-in-the-box has these mandibles that open up like Predator, and it eats one of the teenage cousins. <laughs> so the idea is that it has this insatiable girth, this insatiable length of worm body that needs to be fed all the time. So those are the creatures in Krampus, and once the kid in the family summons Krampus, however, accidentally, the movie really is off to the races. Now, I've talked a lot about the horror so far in this movie, and you all know me, you know I'm a sucker for practical effects, and this film has those out the wazoo. There's a little bit of CGI when Krampus is hopping from roof to roof. Um, we see the daughter, Beth, try to go to her, girl, her boyfriend's house in the middle of this snowstorm, and she's the first one to see Krampus. But the CGI is really good, and, oh, and the gingerbread man, I think, are animated. But out 
outside of that, this is all puppetry to the way to workshop, right? I mean, the way to workshop is they're good at the digital stuff, but they really became lauded and known for the Lord of the Rings trilogy when, you know, they were building a lot of these animatronics and designing this really cool orc makeup. In The Line, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they designed these full-on minotaurs, and they do not disappoint here. I mean, the jack-in-the-box design in itself, The we've all seen demonic toys before, but the idea that they're making this thing an actual worm or serpent, and not only that, they're basing it on its design, right? You could take any toy and just make it creepy, give it teeth, give it slop or whatever, but they're actually looking at what a jack-in-the-box is. It's, you know, it's a little clown with long springs at the bottom that bounce and retract and expand and retract and expand. They're taking the shape of that and they're perverting it. They are distorting it. They are exaggerating it to terrifying lengths. They're really making an extreme jack-in-the-box. So you can tell there's a lot of thought put into the design of these creatures. So I love the, the horror in this movie. What I'm about to say next is going to sound like I'm trashing the movie, and I don't mean to because I wouldn't be featuring it on Slay Mar if I didn't like it, right? I mean, it's like I say in the intro, these are horror movies that I love where the movie maybe doesn't succeed quite as well for me, though, is in these familial relationships. And that's not because the actors are bad. I mean, you have Adam Scott, Tony Collette, David Koechner. Tony Collette especially, I feel like is becoming, I don't want to call her a scream queen of horror because those aren't, that's not the type of role she usually plays, but between The Sixth Sense and Hereditary and Krampus, and I'm probably forgetting some other ones, um, The Lodge, she was in The Lodge, right? Am I making that up? I very well might be. I probably am. I don't think she was in The Lodge. Maybe she was. I'll check on that afterwards. The Lodge, uh, quick side note, The Lodge was the final movie I saw in theaters before quarantine, which is kind of funny, seeing this, uh, this movie about a bunch of people stuck inside, because <laughs> we are about to be a bunch of people stuck inside. Tony Collette has become this oh, horror mainstay, but I don't want to call her screen queen, because I she plays the final girl type role and it, and her roles usually aren't getting chased by something and fleeing they're often more reflective brooding dealing with a lot of internal struggle type of roles and i actually think she elevates the horror movies that she's in so yeah the drama may be not succeeding quite as much the, as the horror it's by no fault of the actors i think for me I just want to see things pushed a little bit more in the front half of the movie. I get, to me, the family seems mildly dysfunctional. They don't seem like their problems are as big or as twisted as I would expect from the director of Trick or Treat, right? And once again, I love this movie. Um, I really think it picks up in the second half when it becomes more of a horror film. I think the horror elements, they get exactly right. And I do care just enough about these characters to want to see them pull through. But one of the central conceits of the movie is that they're dysfunctional, but then they have to kind of band together once things start going south, and they do. And it's fine, but... I, th I think that moment's supposed to feel a lot more rewarding when you see Adam Scott and David Kechter, who are the two father figures in these two very different families. When you see them both have to worry about their kids being in danger, they find common ground. They realize that they've maybe both been jerks in their own way and that maybe they have more common with each other than they thought. And, and it's it's a nice little moment, but I almost feel like once the fa the two different families band together and start killing all these creatures who are a threat to them, I almost feel like it should be a fist-bumping, yay, kind of thing. And I think because they haven't s seemed that far down the rabbit hole of dysfunction up until that point, there's not as much room for them to climb out of, if that makes sense. Like I said, we definitely see them fighting a little bit, but 
once again, this is the dude who directed Trick or Treat, so I'm really expecting <laughs> things to really go south in the beginning. And so I, I think I'm longing for the movie to be just a little bit nastier, just a bit, especially with the dramatic elements. When I was rewatching it this time around, um, when one of uh, the other family's sons, Howie, gets he gets lured by a gingerbread man who gets dropped on the chimney and then tries to eat it and then gets hoisted up the chimney by a hook by Grampus. The fire has gone out at that point and there's a moment where the kids, we see the kid's leg is going up the chimney and his shoe hits a log in the fire that still has some embers circulating around it. And I was convinced that the kid's leg was going to light on fire as he was getting pulled up and he doesn't, he just hits the, he hits the uh, piece of firewood and gets hauled up because I, once again I and maybe it's not fair to compare this movie to Trick or Treat Trick or Treat was independent it was rated R um, it was Michael Doherty's first film he probably had a lot more control over what went, what went into the movie but once again I'm thinking of all the kid harm and kid death in Trick or Treat that's what I'm expecting to happen right and I think that's a perfect encapsulation of what I mean about wanting the movie just to be a little bit nastier and so, yeah, I want to be honest about these films I'm talking about, but like I said, it is by no means a deal breaker for me by the end of the movie, especially when it becomes this all out creature feature and it's just this endless gauntlet of demonic toys. Um, I'm all on board, and that's because of the performances from the cast and also just how cool these creatures look and how cool Grampus looks. And I love that he gets used sparingly. Um, I talk a lot on this Slay Smart channel about how we choose to reveal monsters in movies and how we choose to escalate in movies. And I think this film does a really good job on both of those fronts because you see Grampus first and he's completely in silhouette. And then you see some hoof prints from these huge cloven hooves. Um, you see his legs beneath the car. Uh, you see another silhouette that's a little bit clearer. And then you see him come down the chimney, you get a really good look at his robes and his horns and a little bit of his face. And then later on when the boy finally confronts him and says, I take my wish back, I didn't want this to happen to my family, you see a real close-up of this long tongue and these teeth. And like I said, watching it this time around, I was actually wondering if it was a more goat-like Krampus with red eyes wearing this latex mask. I really love the way that... Dirty than designers choose to un or chose to unveil everything in this film. By the third act, I'm, I'm really forgiving any misgivings I had about the family drama in the beginning. And like I said, the family drama is not bad. These actors are great. They are selling what's there. I think from a script standpoint, I just long to see it pushed in just a slightly more dysfunctional, nastier direction in a way the beginning of Home Alone feels nastier than the beginning of Krampus to me. Um, if you look at how they just unfold that family dynamic with the McAllisters, and they do a really good job of showing how everyone is just awful to Kevin. Just his brothers and sisters, his cousin, I mean, they're so spiteful to him. Um, but hey, movies are hard, right? I haven't made a full-length movie, <laughs> so. Um, and I love Krampus. I'm not saying I could have done it better, but that's just the one thing I'm reminded of when I first start the film, but then we get to the end of the film and I'm really, really, really into it. Um, Michael Doherty, to me, I wish I had more films. He has Trick or Treat, Grampus, and Godzilla King of the Monsters, which I'm also a big fan of. He's three for three for me. Um, yeah, and we'll probably get to uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters one of these days. I watched all 35 Godzilla films back to back, not in one sitting, but over a summer uh, last year. And it was really, really great fun. And uh, yeah, so we'll get to, we'll eventually hit all of Michael Doherty's movies, <laughs> I think. Something else that struck me rewatching the film this time around. And you know what? To be fair to the movie, Maybe it's a sign of the times that I want the family dysfunction to be a little nastier because you know why? 
we're in COVID times right now, right? I've seen some of my family members, but um, obviously we've not done some big get-together like we usually do during holidays and birthdays and whatnot, and I haven't seen all of my family members. Um, some of them, have, like many of you, I haven't gotten to see it all. <laughs> so I'm wondering, because when I was watching this movie in the beginning, when they were showing all this chaotic shopping and this chaotic dinner scene, I almost got nostalgic for dysfunction, if that makes sense. I hope that's not offending anyone out there who come from truly dysfunctional households. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm longing for abuse or harassment or anything. I It just made me a little nostalgic for being around a dinner table and bickering with my extended family and being in the hustle bustle of holiday shopping and feeling stressed out. It, it made me long for those things because we haven't gotten to experience these things in quite a while, right? So maybe, maybe me wanting the movie to go a little nastier and be a little more dysfunctional is a byproduct of me longing for dysfunction right now because the dysfunction in the movie almost feels like comfort to me and maybe I want to feel discomforted in the beginning of the movie, therefore I want things to get pushed a little farther. Um, yeah, it was this really strange sensation watching that opening scene this time around. My wife and I have kind of decked out our living room, and we've got the Christmas tree up. We've got a lot of this little village thing. We've got all the twinkling lights. We have this cozy Christmas hobbit hole, if you will, and I'm watching Krampus in this. And, yeah, watching that mall scene in the beginning, I, I didn't get misty-eyed or anything, but I just got a little nostalgic. So maybe that's on me not on the film we should also talk about the ending of the film real quick which i believe is pretty polarizing but i find it i find it quite satisfying so as i said at the end the the kid tells krampus i want my family back i never wanted you to do all this i didn't want you to drag them to hell and the earth opens up and krampus throws him into the the, the core of the earth into hell and kid wakes up the next day and his family's all together on Christmas morning and they're all getting along I mean you still see some some of their flaws you see you know David Geckner making dumb dirty jokes you see the aunt uh boring schnapps into her morning coffee I mean all their flaws are still there but everyone's getting along really well you suspect that this is probably what what it was like for them before everything started going south um and then, of course, the kid is gifted a jingle bell, which is the sign of Krampus. Um, and it's this sick joke of, okay, Krampus gave him back his family. Um, he's letting everything exist like it was, but then the camera zooms out and everything is caught inside this snow globe. And the snow globe is inside Krampus's workshop, among many other snow globes with many other trapped families. So the idea is that... Krampus did give this kid his wish at the end. He let him have his family back, but they're trapped together for all of eternity, I suppose. Which is a curse in itself, right? I think some people are maybe turned off by that because it's almost the... It was all a dream logic, although that's not what it is, though. I, I don't think it's some deus ex machina move. I think it's very much in line with Krampus's nastiest sense of justice and humor. Because I don't just get that, oh, they were stuck in a snow globe the whole time. I got that, no, this is a pivot. Krampus, in a way, is granting this kid's wish. But like the initial wish, it's be careful what you wish for. Yes, things are like they were. And everyone is alive and they're happy again, but they're all stuck together. And as much as I love Christmas, I would not want to be stuck in Christmas for the rest of my life. That would drive me crazy. Having the same Bing Crosby song on the vinyl player in the same living room with the same people. I think the idea is that they would eventually start to drive each other nuts again, right? If they were driving each other nuts before they were all stuck in the same place together, they're definitely going to do it when they are stuck in this same little snow globe together. And I guess that's that nastiness that I want from the beginning of the movie, right? Because I do think Michael Doherty has a very sick sense of humor, just going off of that Dylan Baker story in, uh, in Trick or Treat. So for me, it's very much in line with Krampus. It's very much in line with his filmography 
and his sensibilities at the end of it. I love the ending of Krampus, and I love Krampus as a film, even though I, I feel like I got a little bit more critical this time around than I usually do. I just had to bring it up because I've seen the film about three or four times now, and every time I'm always caught off guard by the beginning, and then I'm fully on board by the end, so I figured I would mention it. That is Krampus. Um, maybe eventually on Slay Smar as I start to run out of <laughs> Christmas horror movies, although there are a lot of them. Maybe I'll get to one of the lesser-known Krampus films. I've seen A Christmas Horror Story. I don't think I've seen any of the other ones, but it looks like there's a lot of Krampus movies, some of them which came out before this one, which is interesting. Maybe I'll get to those one day. We'll see. As for next week, I've actually watched all but one of the films I want to cover this month, or rewatched, I should say. I'm deciding between next week. As I said, we need to get to the really mega, big, grand nephew <laughs> Christmas movie that I mentioned at the beginning. Let me know in the comments if you think you know what it is. There are probably a few that come to mind, but really think about it. Think about me. Think about what I like. You'll probably guess what film it is. I don't know if I want to do that one next week or more of a left field one next week. We'll see. I'm still debating. But I will be here with my Santa hat. I'll probably keep my little Krampus behind me up. <laughs> um, and for the, the grandnephew of Christmas horror films, I have some other things I can put up to. It should be fun. Thank you so much for watching, as always. Uh, if you like what you see, please do share it on social media. We're getting close to 100 subscribers. I would love to hit 100 uh, subscribers by the end of the, the year. If not, it's no biggie. There are some artists who have way more subscribers than that but 100 to me feels pretty cool huh? for having just started this channel this year so uh, spread the word if you like what you see slash hear invite more people to the community um, I hope you're having a safe happy healthy holiday season wherever you are whatever you celebrate I hope it's going well for you or whatever you don't celebrate you may not celebrate any kind of holiday right now that's cool too um I do hope you're doing well, sincerely. And as always, I want to thank you for watching. So until next week, stay well. <laughs> get some rest. Get some sleep. Don't have nightmares, except for the good kind. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.